But here's the fact. If your path looks like your destination, then you've already arrived. But if the path looks different from where you're headed, it simply means the journey's not over. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. Life's disappointments become God's appointments when we embrace His purpose. Samuel was so excited to be returning home to his village of Sawaliga in Upper East Region. He'd left there nearly 20 years earlier as a youth to go to southern Ghana to seek fame and fortune. And now he was returning home for the first time in nearly 20 years with his wife and his children. He was excited to get back to his village and settle down and revive his family's farmland. But that wasn't the only thing that excited him. Not only was he going to see relatives, but he was also coming with something very important he discovered in southern Ghana. You see, when Samuel left as a young man, he'd come to the south to get his fame and fortune, but he discovered something even more important. He heard the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time. And he accepted Christ into his heart and became a Christian. He started attending church and growing in his faith. And now, when he was going back home, he wanted to share that good news with everyone. There was no church in Sawaliga. There were no Christians there. But Samuel smiled as he thought of people giving their lives to Christ. And he planned on opening a church. But when Samuel began to share the gospel, he met with unexpected resistance. In fact, the chief in Sawaliga forbade him to open a church and commanded him to stop preaching the gospel. The persecution increased until finally the chief decided to exile Samuel and his family and drive them from the town. In fact, in order to purge them from the village, he ordered Samuel to dig up the dead corpse of his deceased daughter and carry her out, banished. And he warned them, if you ever come again, you will die. Samuel's heart was broken. All the years of expectation, all the hopes he had, all the great expectation of, of a church and of people coming to Christ was suddenly shattered. The door slammed shut and every hope seemed lost. But the fear of death and the love of God could not be quenched uh, in his heart. The fear of death had no hold of him because the love of God was greater. And so Samuel and his family took refuge in a nearby village and they began to pray. They began to pray that God would bring revival to Sawaliga, that a church would be opened, and that he would be able to return. Years went by in darkness with no visible answer to his prayer, no manifestation. But then, in 2016... God answered Samuel's prayer. A team from the Agape House New Testament Church went to Sawaliga to preach the gospel. And a church was planted. Of the 400 inhabitants of Sawaliga, 200 gave their lives to Christ. And Samuel and his family moved back and is now an elder at the church we planted in Sawaliga. When it seemed as if there was no way back, when it seemed as if all hope was gone, Jesus made a way for Samuel and his family to come home, for a church to be planted, and for souls to be saved. And in the inspiring true story of the church at Sawaliga, there's a message for all of us. You see, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how long it takes, no matter how many doors are closed, no matter how many hopes are dashed, when you have an encounter with God, everything can be restored stored for nothing is impossible with the Lord. Sometimes it seems like there's no way back. Sometimes it seems there's no restoration, but God is able and God is willing and Jesus can restore anybody, anywhere, at any time. If you believe it, say amen. And in that powerful truth, there's a message for us. See, if Jesus could come back from the dead, he can resurrect your dead marriage. He can resurrect your dead dream. He can resurrect your dead career. If Jesus could conquer hell, he can heal every hurt. If he could come back to life, there's nothing he cannot do in your own life. Then Jesus is able to restore you. And when you encounter Jesus Christ, you will be restored. Before we go on, let's bow our heads 
and pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you that we are here on holy ground in your holy presence by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask, O oh God, that you come now and pour out your Spirit in our hearts and minds. Illuminate our lives. Give us the truth and the grace to live according to it. We bind every spirit of the enemy as we submit to you, Lord Jesus. We command every voice of deception to be silent and we loose the spirit of the living God to flow in us and restore what's been lost. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. I want to invite you to join your faith with me right now. Go ahead and put your hand on your chest and pray after me. Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And to help us learn the truth for today, we've printed the world-famous Agape House sermon notes. They're inside your bulletin, and I invite you to take them out now and follow along with me as we discover three ways Jesus restores me. There at the top of your notes is our scripture text, a short passage taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24. It's the story of two disciples who were on their way to the village of Emmaus on Easter. Easter Sunday. But even though it was Easter Sunday, they were living like all hope was gone. They were disappointed and filled with doubt and dry spiritually. But suddenly, when Jesus came along, their lives were turned around. Now, it's a long story, so I'm just going to begin by reading the opening, and then as we go through the sermon, we're going to unpack the story for you. Now receive the word of the Lord from Luke 24, 13 to 16. That very day, tell your neighbor that very day, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself, eh, not a substitute, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Think about what is happening as this story begins. The Bible says that very day. That very day was Easter Sunday. That very day Jesus rose from the dead. That very day the stone was rolled away. That very day the tomb was empty. It should have been a time of rejoicing. But instead of that, these disciples were not rejoicing. The Bible says in verse 17, and they stood still looking sad. They were not at the empty tomb celebrating. They were not in the temple praying. They were not fellowshipping in the upper room. They were wandering off in the wrong direction, away from God's will, away from Jerusalem, away from their destiny. They were leaving with their heads down, their hankies out, and their hearts filled with grief. These two disciples were not expecting an encounter with Jesus. It's not that they'd not heard the good news. Later they would confess with their own mouth that Mary had come and Peter had come and John had come to testify. People they knew and trusted had declared to them, we saw an empty tomb. But for some reason, these two disciples are so overcome with disappointment and doubt and dryness that they don't follow the testimony. They go their own way. Maybe you're here today like those two disciples. Maybe you're here and your heart is filled with disappointment or doubt or dryness. Other people are testifying what God has done. Other people are declaring answers to prayer, but you have no testimony, no good news. You simply have the pain in your heart, the confusion and the crying, and you're carried away from where God wants you. Like these two disciples, you need Jesus to restore you. But the good news is, Jesus is in the restoration business. See, he didn't leave these two disciples. He'd just gotten up from the grave. He'd just risen from the dead. But he chases them down on the road to Emmaus. He won't let them go. He won't let them backslide. He won't leave them alone. He comes around to embrace them and to bring them back to him so they can fulfill their purpose. And what he did for them, he's going to do for you. So let's discover three ways Jesus restores me. And here's your first truth today. Jesus restores me when I'm disappointed. Everybody say disappointed. 
Is anybody disappointed here today? Maybe you've been disappointed in your marriage, or maybe you're disappointed in your job, or maybe you've been disappointed at the embassy or in your career. But today, for everyone who's disappointed, we can point to these two men because they were also disappointed. In verse 17, the Bible says, they stood still looking sad. On a day of great joy, they were sad because they were disappointed. And because of their disappointment, they left Jerusalem and headed in the wrong direction. They gave up on God's plan and started to pursue their own plan. But what these men didn't know is that Jesus was right there with them. They didn't recognize him at first, but he'd come to walk with them and talk them. He'd come to teach them. He came alongside them to bring them back. He was doing all of that as they went astray on the road to Emmaus. And that's what every one of us needs to know today. No matter what you're facing, no matter what your circumstances look like, no matter how things have gone astray, Jesus is still near you. He's still working with you. No matter how far you wander, no matter how disappointed you get, Jesus will not give up on you. And God is still working in your life. If you believe it, say amen. For Philippians 2.13 says, God is working in you. Put your hand on your chest and say, God is working in me. He wants your plans and your acts to fulfill his good purpose. So God is coming alongside you today. He's working in you. He's directing you. He's leading you. He's developing you on the path. Whether you see it or not, God is working. That's why you need to remember this today. Don't judge the journey before it's over. See, too often we start out on the journey to a destination, but along the road the journey doesn't look the way we thought. We're looking for a destination and the journey looks difficult. We're looking for a landing spot and the journey looks uncomfortable. And we suppose we've made a mistake and we leave the path God set for us and go our own way. But what the disciples didn't know is that this journey would lead them to a breakthrough. This journey would lead them to encounter. This journey would turn their lives around and they would be restored. So do not judge the journey before it's over. If you trust in God's promise, you have to trust in God's path. These two disciples believed in the promise of God. They believed in the Messiah. They believed that the hope of Israel had come. They believed that God had come in Jesus to save them. But when the path took them in a different direction, they became disappointed. They got their eyes on the path instead of the promise and they got disheartened for the path to restoration went through the cross and the path to redemption went through the grave and the path to salvation took them in a journey they did not expect, in a way they did not expect. And because of the path not looking like they thought it should, they gave up on the promise. But here's the fact. If your path looks like your destination, then you've already arrived. But if the path looks different from where you're headed, it simply means the journey's not over. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. Life's disappointments become God's appointments when we embrace his purpose. That's the amazing truth we can learn from a Chinese couple named Zhao Zaqing and Zhao Fei. It all began last December when Zhao Fei asked Zhao Zaqing out on a date. At first, she confesses that she wasn't too impressed with him, but the first date went okay, so they agreed to go on a second date, and that's when things took an unexpected turn. Zhao Fei decided to take Jacqueline home to meet his parents on their second date. And while the four of them were there, this young lady and the young man and his parents on their second date, the government of China declared an emergency immediate lockdown due to COVID. No one could leave where they were. You had to stay in place. Hey! So on their second date, this lady is trapped in the house with this guy, Zhao Fei, and his parents. Can anyone say, awkward? <laughs> At first, it was really embarrassing. Listen to what she told the China Morning Post, South China Morning Post. At first, it was embarrassing for me to live in another person's home. But life's disappointments can become divine appointments when you don't 
lose hope. And as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into a month of lockdown, suddenly love began to blossom. And before you knew what happened, the two Zhao's were falling in love. The lockdown continued for a month, but their relationship will go on for a long time because they're now engaged to be married. And in their story, there's a lesson for all of us. Don't judge the journey before it's over. Because no matter how things look on the path, the promise is ahead and God's grace is at work. That's why Romans 8.28 says, we know that God causes everything. Somebody say everything. Everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And if you'll submit to God, and if you'll continue to follow God's path, he will bring it to pass in your life. He will work every detail out on the journey to get you to your destination. The problem for a lot of us is we get excited about the promise, but we don't like the path. We get excited about the promise, but when the path doesn't take us in the way we thought, we begin to doubt God and we get disappointed. That's why you have to focus your expectation on on God. For when you focus and center your expectation on God, you will never be shaken. You will never be moved. David said in Psalm 62, my soul waits silently for God alone for my expectation. Everybody say expectation. My expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And I declare to you today, when you center your expectation on God, you will not be moved. When you center your expectation on God, you will not be shaken. When you center your expectation on God, you will not divert to plan B. You will not go astray. You will remain in the center of God's will. For when you allow the truth of the resurrection to guide your expectation, you know that all things are possible with the Lord. And when your eyes are on the risen Lord and your expectation is on him, you know he can restore everything no matter what's been lost, no matter how disappointed you are, God can bring it back again. If you believe it, say amen. That's why 1 Peter 1, 3 says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Because Christ is risen, we live with expectation. Because he came back from the dead, we live with expectation. Because God's power brought him to life, we live with great expectation. Because God can resurrect any dream, any relationship, any job, any career, any finance, anything can come back when you have his power. That's what happened to these two disciples. They were on the wrong path, going in the wrong direction with their heads down and their hearts broken. But Jesus came alongside them. And this is the picture of grace. He's just risen from the dead. He's the greatest king of the universe. And yet he leaves everything to chase these two disciples down on the road and embrace them. He knows that it's grace that is needed. Because when you're filled with disappointment, you need God's grace. And if you're disappointed today... I extend the grace of God to you right now to come and comfort your heart. God will not leave you. God will not forsake you. God will not abandon you. He will chase you down, and his grace will catch you in your time of disappointment. Ask God for grace. For Paul said in Philippians 4, I have learned the secret of how to live through any kind of situation. I can live through devaluation. I can live through inflation. I can live through divorce. I can live through death. I can live through anything. When I have enough to eat or when I'm hungry, when I have everything I need or when I have nothing. Christ is the one who gives me the strength I need to do whatever I must do. Somebody shout grace. grace. And no matter what path you're on today, the grace of God is coming to bring you back from disappointment. And that brings us to our second truth today. Jesus restores me when I doubt. Everybody say doubt. Is anybody having doubts? Today, these disciples had doubts. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 21. But we had hoped 
that he was the one to redeem Israel. They were speaking in the past tense. Turn your notes over to page two and understand what they were saying. We used to hope. We used to have faith. We had expectation before, but now we doubt. They were standing next to the word of God incarnate, but they doubted the word of God. Hey! They were standing next to the one who just rose from the dead that very day, and they're doubting his power to solve their problem. Hey! They were standing next to the king of kings and the lord of lords who conquered Satan and put him to shame, and they're doubting whether God can solve their problem. Hey! Are you doubting today? The problem was not that they didn't know the word. The problem was they were evaluating the word of God by their experience instead of evaluating their experience by the word of God. And that's what happens to a lot of us. We go through a trial, a trauma, a storm, and we begin to evaluate the word of God based on what we're passing through rather than basing our evaluation of our experience on God's word. And you keep trying to figure it out, you keep trying to work it out, but the only thing you need that will make sense of life is the word of God. That's why Jesus rightly said to these disciples, oh, foolish people, because it's foolish to doubt God's word. And God says to us today, when you doubt, oh, foolish people, trust in me, for he has the word that never fails. That's why Proverbs 30 says, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. Do not add to his words, or he may rebuke you and expose you as a liar. God's calling us today to understand how good his word is. We don't need to doubt. The problem is we add words. What ad words do we add? We add the word, but. I know God is faithful, but it doesn't feel like it. I know he said we shouldn't doubt, but. I don't see my way out. I know the Bible says he's in control, but I think I better use my ways and means to take control because I doubt he can do it. I know he said we should not commit fornication, but tell your neighbor he's talking about you. Are you, see are you serious? Are you seriously trying to tell me that the God of heaven and earth, the God who rose from the dead, are you seriously trying to tell me he can't solve your problem? Are you trying to tell me the God who rolled away the stone and came back to life and is seated on the throne of heaven, are you seriously trying to tell me he can't pay your rent? He can't give you a husband? He can't give you a child? Are you seriously trying to tell me that the God who rules over everything is not strong enough to pull you out and restore you? The Bible says in Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And the news for all of us today is that God's word will remain. Everything you trust in will fail, but God's word will remain. So keep praying, keep trusting, keep believing. Don't doubt God's word. That's the lesson we can learn from 56-year-old Victoria Adorgu from Ghana. Victoria Dorgu and her husband tried for many, many years to have children. They did everything. They prayed. They fasted. But there was no child. She was barren. And the 56-year-old was praying and fasting, trusting God, but nothing was working. And to make matters worse, not only was she barren, people were mocking her and ridiculing her and tormenting her and persecuting her. So she had the pain of being barren and she had the pain of people torment for her condition. If anyone could have given up hope, it was Victoria Adorgu. But she kept on believing, kept on trusting, kept on holding on to God's word. And this last April 2022, 56-year-old Victoria Adorgu gave birth here in Accra for the first time. Aye. And not only did she give birth, she gave birth to twins, hallelujah, double, double, hey. Listen to her testimony in her own words. Thanks to Jesus and those who are praying for me, thanks. I'm now called a mother. 
God has done a big thing for me. I encourage those who didn't have, they should pray. A time will come. Just one day, God will do it. I pray for others, Victoria says. A lot of people should have the belief that God will do a miracle for them. I'm now called a mother at 56 years. And I've tried and tried and prayed. And God has done a miracle. Because when you stand in faith and trust in his word, God comes to restore you. When you stand in faith and submit to his word, then God can do the impossible. For Luke 1.37, the Bible says the word of God will never fail. That's why Jesus' response to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus when they were filled with doubt was to give them the word. Listen to verse 27. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself because when you're filled with doubt what you need is God's word the only thing that will carry you through tough economic times is the word of God the only thing that will take you through the difficult end times is the word of God the only thing that will take you through marital challenge is the word of God the only thing that will help you when everything seems lost is the word of God these men were walking away from their destiny their heads were down their hearts were broken but God came with grace to bring them back and he gave them the word to build them up so do not doubt his word because all you need is a word somebody shout word Psalm 12, 6 says, the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. And today, God is calling you to trust in his word like a little child trusting in the promise of your heavenly father. Many years ago, my wife and I and our family were traveling from Ghana to the United States. We happened to fly on British Airways, and we landed and changed planes in the infamous Heathrow Airport. It was crowded that day with passengers from all over the world, and we made ourselves as comfortable as we could while we waited for our flight to the U.S. But after a while, I wanted to stretch my legs, so I told my wife, let's go for a stroll. And I went to my son, my oldest son, Richard. He was 12 years old, and I said, Richard, I want to go walk around with your mom, please. Here's your two-year-old brother, Kofi. Don't let him out of your sight. Watch him. I'm giving you Kofi to watch. Don't lose him. Then my wife and I went for a stroll. We went and looked at the shops. We jostled with the crowd. After we'd stretched our legs for a while, we went back. And when I got back, I knew there was trouble because I saw Richard by himself reading a book. And I went over and said, Richard, where is Kofi? Where is your brother? And he looked at me and said, who? <laughs> who? Who? Your two-year-old brother. I told you don't lose him. Don't let him out of your sight. He said, uh -huh. I started to panic. I mean, there were planes going to Shanghai and Dubai. I pictured someone taking Kofi and getting on a plane, and I would never see him again. I pictured someone taking him into the streets of London. Oh, my God, Kofi, Kofi. I started running through the terminal. Kofi, where are you? And then I saw him. My heart was pounding, but he was cool as a cucumber. My brow was sweating and I was worried, but he was at peace. He was at the window watching the planes land and take off. Watching the planes land and take off. I went over to him. I said, Kofi, my baby. He said, hi, Dad. Oh. He was a child. He knew that even if he couldn't see me, his dad could see him. He knew that even if I wasn't right by him, I was watching over him. And when you have a childlike faith, you know that even when you don't see God, he sees you. Even when you don't feel God, God embraces you. That's why God wants us to be humble and trust him like a little child. For Jesus said in Matthew 18, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And God is saying today, for your doubt, come to him like a child. For your doubt, come to him and trust him. For your doubt, come to him and say, Daddy, I'm here. I need you. He gives grace for your disappointment. He gives his promise of the word 
for your doubt. And that brings us to our third truth. Jesus restores me when I'm dry. Everybody say dry. Is anybody here dry today? Are you dry? I'm talking about a spiritual dryness. A dryness where you used to pray, but now praying seems so hard. You used to read the Bible and get excited and get revelation, but now you read it and it just doesn't make sense. These disciples were dry. You know how I know? Because they had the opportunity to meet Christ earlier, but they didn't. They were dry. Verse 24 says, some of those who were with us, this is the disciples talking, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. So wait a minute. People you knew and people you trusted came back to confess the tomb was empty. People you knew like Peter and John and Mary, you knew them, you trusted them, they're your friends, they're in fellowship with you, they're in your life group. They came to tell you and you could not get up from where you were and walk the short distance to the tomb to see for yourself. You're lazy, spiritually lazy. The distance from where they were to the empty tomb was about one or two miles. The distance to Emmaus was seven miles. But in their dryness, they chose to go seven miles in the wrong direction rather than getting up to walk one or two miles in the right direction. Why didn't they seek God? Why didn't they come close to him? Why didn't they turn their hearts to him? Why don't we? For the Bible tells us in James 4, 8, come close to God and God will come close to you. And all it takes for you to overcome dryness is just to turn to God. Just simply turn and lift your hands and say, God, I'm coming, I'm coming. For every step you take, he takes 10. For every step you take, he takes 100. Just turn and say, God, I need you. I'm empty, I'm dry, my spirit is down, my devotions are down. Any of the disciples could have gone to the tomb and any one of us could come to the presence of God today. I believe today that Jesus will meet you if you get up and meet him. I believe Jesus will encounter you if you get up and call upon him. I believe Jesus will come closer to you. You will know him more. You will experience him more if you simply turn and worship him. For 1 Chronicles 28.9 says, learn to know God intimately. Worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord sees every heart and knows every plan and thought. If you seek him, you will find him. When you're dry, you need a revelation of Jesus. That's what Jesus gave to these two disciples. Later on, as they walked to Emmaus, they reached their destination, and they went inside to eat, and Jesus came with them. And verse 30 and 31 says, when Jesus was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. For their dry condition, Jesus gave them his presence. And when you're spiritually dry, you need God's glory. You need to encounter Jesus. You need him to come near to you. I'm not talking about about knowledge. I'm talking about a personal relationship with God. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a revelation of who he is. I'm not talking about ritual and going to church on Sunday. I'm talking about Christ within me. For when you get a revelation of Jesus, when you see him face to face, when you encounter God, your life will never be the same. That's what Job declared in Job 42. Listen carefully. In the past, I heard about you, but now, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. I'm ashamed of myself and I'm so sorry. As I sit in the dust and ashes, I promise to change my heart and my life. See, Job had heard. He'd been in Sunday school. He knew all the Bible stories. He'd heard testimonies. He'd heard glowing reports. He knew what God had done for others. But that wasn't enough. He had to see God. He had to experience God. He had to encounter God. And when he did, he said, everything's changed. My life, my heart, everything's changed. And that's what will happen to you when you not only hear about him, but you see him. For when you dry, you need the glory of God. If we had a visitation from the Lord physically right here in this chapel right now, we would all be on our faces worshiping him. We would all be changed. For that's the experience of every man and every woman of God. Anyone who ever encountered him became transformed, became restored. What we need is a divine encounter. What we need is a revelation of Jesus. All your problems would be solved with just one moment in his presence. All your disappointment would be eradicated 
with just one vision of Jesus. All your doubt would dissipate with just a word from God. All your dryness can be washed away in just a moment. And that's why Jesus died and rose again. He restored us to relationship with God so that we could come in and come close to him. And today, if you're disappointed, God's grace is coming to chase you. If you're doubt-filled, God's word holds true for you. If you're dry, God's presence is right at hand calling you. For Hebrews 10.21 says, Since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into, let us go right into, let us go right into the presence of God with a sincere heart, fully trusting him. So come on. Yenko, 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 Bra, come on. Let's go. Let's go right in. Let's go right into the presence of God. Let's encounter him. Let's worship him. Yenko, Yenko, let's go and meet God where our lives will be changed, our disappointment washed away, our doubts relieved, our dryness settled. Let's go in to be restored by Jesus as we encounter him. Thank you for joining me today on Truth For Today. I trust that this message has been a blessing to you. I've got a lot more great content to share with you to build your faith and help you to soar. So be sure to follow me on all my social media platforms. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. When you do, click the notification bell so that you can get an alert when my new sermons drop. By God's grace, we're reaching people all over the world with truth for today. And the good news is you can be a part of this outreach to glorify God and transform lives. When you sow into this ministry, you help us spread God's word to people everywhere. Join me in this ministry by hitting the donate button on my website. And of course, remember to share this message with your friends and your family. God richly bless you today. I'm praying for you and I look forward to seeing you next time on Truth For Today.